Hello everybody and welcome to the last lecture of the Elements of Sustainability series. And what a great way to close it, uh, that by bringing you uh, Professor Andy Hoffman of the University of Michigan. Professor Hoffman is a known scholar that has written 15 books and over 100 articles. He studies uh, the sustainability issues and opportunities for businesses. So it is with great pleasure that I bring to you Professor Andy Hoffman. Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erica. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to present some work that I've been doing on uh, the future of business sustainability. Um, so what I want to talk about today is where we've been and where we're going on this topic. Let's begin just by focusing on the growth uh, and the success, increased attention that uh, sustainability has received within business practice. Uh, it's come a long way since the dawn of the modern environmental movement in the 70s and the formation of the EPA. Uh, around the mid-1990s, it grew to become a strategic concern. And you can see in corporations uh, the development of uh, dedicated corporate sustainability programs. In 2001, there were just over 100 companies doing it. Now there are more than 330. Companies produce annual sustainability reports. They have positions like chief sustainability officer. They post data for the Carbon Disclosure Project or the Global Reporting Initiative. Uh, it really has become core to business strategy. In fact, in 2010, more than 90% of CEOs surveyed believed that sustainability was important to the company's profits. And I would add that 72% of those executives identified education as one of the critical development issues for the future success of their business sustainability efforts. And that's where the work that we do at the University of Michigan and elsewhere becomes so important. As I look at the students that I teach, 88% uh, of business school students think that learning about social and environmental issues in business is a priority, and 67% want to use this in their future career growth. So the demand is there, and the supply is responding. You can see the growth in the number of business schools requiring a sustainability-focused course growing quite rapidly. And uh, you can find specific sustainability programs in 46% of the top 100 MBA programs in the US, and that number continues to grow. Uh, in the words of the, the former dean at the Ross School of Business, sustainability has become table stakes in management education. I would also add that in terms of business research, you can see here the growth starting in the mid-1990s and taking off from there. And that's where I really mark the beginning of corporate sustainability as a strategic issue uh, in the mid-1990s, taking us up until the present. But there is a shift afoot of how we think about business sustainability, how we address the issue in practice, in teaching, and in research. And I want to focus on where we've been and where we're going. To do that, I'd like you to think about business sustainability in two different ways. The first is enterprise integration. This is the way we've been covering the topic uh, since the, the mid-1990s up until the present. And then the second is market transformation, where we're going from here. The first is all about developing tools and models for companies to respond to market pressures. They translate it into pre-existing business considerations, and that is very expedient, is very practical. It gets people's attention. The next phase focuses on transforming the markets by re-examining some taken-for-granted ideas about capitalism, consumption, the role of corporation in society. We really are in an exciting time, and I see it in my students, and I see it in the business people I talk to, that there are uh, really the, the beginnings of a new way of thinking about business sustainability going forward. This is tremendously important because if we are going to deal with the sustainability challenges of our day, business has to really lead the way. The market is the most powerful institution on earth. Business is the most powerful entity within it. If business isn't solving these problems, they will not get solved. They, they build in the, the buildings we live and work in. They provide the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the forms of mobility we enjoy, the drivetrain under the hood, or the alternatives that might replace that car sitting in your driveway. These all come from business. And if business doesn't find the alternatives and the solutions, in my opinion, they will not be found. They, it's not that they're the only ones that can create these kinds of solutions, but with their powers of ideation, production, resource use, uh, they're the only ones that can provide the solutions at the scale we need. Some people may lament the fact that business has become so powerful within our world today, but it is a fact. And if we're gonna deal with these issues, 
the solutions have to come from business. So let me walk through sustainability 1.0 on the left, enterprise integration, and then I'll talk about market transformation on the right, uh, as business sustainability 2.0. To begin, business sustainability 1.0, enterprise integration. Uh, the way I've been teaching it, the way business thinks about it, we think about sustainability as a market shift. And so I have some examples of market shifts up on the board here or on the slide. Uh, I like to use these with my students and I point to the bottom left and ask them if they've ever seen one of these devices before. And I think you'd be impressed how many people, how many young people have not seen one of these. This is called, of course called a typewriter. And then I ask them, what do they see on the right? And that, of course, is a laptop computer, and they all raise their hand. But then I ask them, how many people have heard of Smith Corona or Brother or IBM? And all the hands shoot up with IBM. Now, those were the three primary typewriter manufacturers in the world. Two of them are gone. One of them is still here. Two of them did not see the market shift in play. One of them did, and they adapted and environmental issues, social issues, sustainability can create that kind of a shift in the market. Um, I remember, and many of you may as well, when Stephen Jobs pronounced a day when he thought that there would be a computer in every home. And I and my colleagues thought, what, what, this is crazy. Who wants a computer in their home? And now imagine a home without a computer. And that's the extent and the scale and the scope of the market shift. Up above that, we have cell phone, or I'm sorry, um, uh, wireless phones or wires to run telephone lines, and now we have cellular networks. And developing countries can leapfrog. They don't need to run these telephone poles and wires anymore. They go straight to a cellular network. Sustainability can do that. And then in the bottom, next to the typewriter, we have a Sony Walkman, which I, when I grew up, that was my personal music um, uh, system. And on the right, we have the iPod. And I use this as an example to point out the culture shift that can come with a market shift. Uh, and the, the, the iPod is intuitive to kids today. You walk into an Apple store and you'll see a table that sits probably a foot and a half off the ground. And you'll watch five and six year olds walk up and start playing on the computer. They understand it. The uh, device on the bottom left is not intuitive. In fact, last year at NPR did a little segment where they gave a 13 year old uh, a Walkman took away his iPod and said, live with this for a week. And they interviewed him at the end of the week and he said it wasn't until halfway through the week where he realized you had to take the cassette tape out, turn it over and put it back in to hear the other side. Uh, he didn't really have the intuitive sense of using it, but now the intuitive sense of the iPod, it changes our culture. Uh, it changes what we do in higher education. Uh, a student ostensibly can have uh, access to any fact at any time through his or her iPod. And I put facts in quotes. Because what we do now in higher education, we can teach information, but we also have to teach students how to be discerning consumers of that information because there are variable qualities of information out there that are starting to cloud uh, public debate and how we think about issues. So again, the cultural dimensions of these market shifts. Now, once I do this, now sustainability becomes a market issue. Uh, and we can just break it down into a standard way of approaching any kind of market shift in business strategy. And to do that, you can just ask three basic questions. First of all, who is driving it externally? And we have governments, suppliers and buyers, insurance companies, banks, investors. I can go through the whole list. The key there is that you will not see the natural environment. You will not see uh, poor people, you will see these issues translated for business through these particular constituents and business will listen to them. If you remember a number of years ago, there was a group called uh, What Would Jesus Drive? And the idea was that perhaps Jesus would not drive a big SUV, he would drive a, uh, uh, an electric or a hybrid car. And we could smirk at that. But it's interesting because the CEOs of the big three granted these people an audience to listen to what they had to say. Why did they do this? Well, it wasn't to really re-examine re their relationship with Jesus Christ. They were looking to see, are these people going to affect consumers and change the demand for the high margin products that they're providing, such as SUVs and pickup trucks. And so it gets translated through these issues. You can see in their employees and job applicants. Uh, a lot of companies recognize that students want these topics to be handled uh, in, in their companies and they're trying to appeal to them by developing sustainability agendas. The CEO of Patagonia loves to boast that for every opening they have, they have 5,000 applicants. 
And that's because of their strong sustainability stand. New applicants want this. Young people want this. And so the first question is, who is driving it? And you better connect it to that kind of a constituent. And I teach my students, if you walk into the CEO's office and say, we need to attend to sustainability because it's the right thing to do, you might get some attention. If you walk in and say, insurance companies are demanding it, banks are concerned about it, investors are changing our cost of capital, now you've got the attention of the CEO. The second question, what business department will handle it internally? And if sustainability is handled in government affairs or procurement, operations or human rate relations or uh, media relations, it gives you a sense of how the company is going to handle it. Almost think about it like a game, the, the children's game where one person whispers in the next year and then it goes around the room and what comes out the other side is fundamentally different. Each of these departments will frame the issue differently. And you can learn a lot from a company by how, where they house their sustainability operation. If it's in operations, it's at the core of the company. It's what they do. If it's in community relations or media relations or marketing, it may have more of a veneer aspect to it. And so you want to look at the department that's handling it. At the end of the day, to make the business case on sustainability, you have to ask what frame best explains a business imperative to handle sustainability. And so this is how I teach sustainability. I teach it as regulatory compliance or corporate culture. I teach it as cost of capital or operational efficiency. And this is the language of business. And this is the way to translate into a business uh, a form that, that anyone within the company can, can respond to. When I hear companies say that we're doing this because it's the right thing to do, I try and look past that and say, what, what are the real business case? What is the real business case for addressing this? And this is what uh, will get uh, companies to attend to this issue. I, I once gave a talk at the Michigan Manufacturers Association on climate change strategy for businesses. And let's just say that they weren't super excited to hear what I had to say. And before my talk began, a gentleman came in and he slapped a book on the table right in front of me for deliberate effect for me. And the book was facing me and it was called The Climate Hoax. So I kind of knew where he was going to go with his questions. In the middle of my talk, he interrupted. He said, this is all nonsense because climate change is hoax. And my response was this. I said, I don't care. You can be agnostic about the science of climate change and still see it as a business issue because it's going to affect you in one of these areas, whether it's consumer demand or operational efficiency, cost of capital or regulatory compliance. Your market is shifting. Adapt if you wish. I really don't care. And there was nothing you could say. I put it into straight standard business language. And uh, I had the attention of the audience. They understood it because I was putting it in a form that they could connect to their business the next day. And so we can think about market shifts around sustainability. And here are a number of them in play right now. Uh, in the upper left, we have an incandescent light bulb. Should you invest in incandescent light bulb companies? I think the answer is quite clearly no. Should you invest in compact fluorescent light bulb companies? Maybe. Should you be investing in LED companies? most likely. Now this is the typewriter story. Technology to make an incandescent light bulb and a compact fluorescent is basically the same. You run electricity through a, a filament or a gas. It gets excited, it creates light. LED is a totally different technology. It's solid state technology. It's a different set of players, a different set of competencies. And that's how sustainability can shift a market. We can also talk about the iPod story and the shift in culture. Right next to that light bulb, I have a standard dome thermostat. In the upper right, I have a Nest thermostat, and right next to that, I have the Eco Dashboard by GE. Now, the, 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 the Nest thermostat is a very interesting innovation in where we're going in the smart home. I have one in my home, and it is, a, it is designed by Apple engineers, so it's intuitive and it's beautiful. Um, it's programmable, nothing new there. But then it starts to have some features that are fundamentally different. Uh, for one... It has a sensor in it that knows when I'm not home, and it will dial the house down to 50 degrees, the temperature I gave it, so that I will conserve energy when I'm not there. It is starting to learn. Uh, it also notices if I start to change the settings, if I start to you know, get up earlier every morning and turn the, the, the temperature up, it will change the program for me. It will learn my behavior. And it is connected to my iPhone. So when I land at Detroit Metro Airport, I pull out my iPhone, I dial the house back up to a temperature that I want it to be at when I arrive home in 30 minutes, and I come home to a warm house. Siemens actually has a, th a thermostat that will track, if you let it, track your cell phone, 
and it knows the direction you're moving. And when you get within a certain radius of your home, it will automatically take care of it for you. It'll automatically dial the house up. There is the smart home coming, and that is driven by people's concerns for sustainability and ease of use. And people will start to learn how their behavior starts to affect their energy bill. And that's where the GE Eco Dashboard to the left of it comes in. That will give you a real-time display of your energy and water use. And so, for example, your son or daughter may come home from college one day and kind of get up on Saturday morning and take their standard two-hour hot shower. And you will have a real-time display of how much water and energy they use and how much that cost. And you could have your daughter or son come downstairs and you can point at this and said, that shower just cost X dollars. Please don't do that again. And now you can connect behavior to your energy bill, where it used to be the energy bill comes at the end of the month. I pay it. I have no idea why it's so big. It just is what it is. Now I can start to learn about how my behaviors change my, my energy bill. And so, for example, you might go on vacation and you'll shut everything off in the house. And then you'll see it's still uh, using energy and you'll start to learn about phantom loads and you'll learn about things, for example, that 60 inch plasma TV you have hanging on that wall that you love so much. That TV uses more energy turned off than a regular TV uses turned on because you have to keep the plasma warm for an instant on. Or you'll turn off the cable, you'll turn off the cable box and you'll learn that you've actually turned off nothing. You've turned off the LED display in the front, but the guts are still going so that the cable companies can still track it. And then you start to think about all the ways your house is using energy when it doesn't need to. When I go away, that hot water heater in my basement is still creating hot water for someone who's not here. And you may start to think about instant hot water heaters when the next time you need to replace it. And so it will start to change how we think about energy. It will change our culture. If you really want to talk about bending your mind on changing a culture, right next to that thermostat is a front-loading washer. These were introduced into the American market uh, just over 10 years ago. And it was a tough sell. Manufacturers like Whirlpool found that people looked at these and said, it uses less energy, less water. I'm not going to buy one. It must not clean so well. And they had to do a lot of work with uh, retailers like Lowe's and Sears and Home Depot on how to sell them. They worked with Consumer Reports on how to teach people that energy savings can clean just as well. And there is now market acceptance of a front-loading washer. If you look on the right below the uh, Eco Dashboard, You'll see a gentleman in a lab coat with a washing machine. This is a company in Sweden, and they're developing a washing machine that uses no water at all. It uses nylon beads to clean clothing. And you want to talk about a culture shift there. Um, people are going to, this is going to be a really tough sell to get people to buy these because they feel that water is necessary, and particular hot water is necessary to clean clothes. So there's sustainability market shifts in play. I can go through a few others. We can have uh, on the left, you have an SUV. You can buy a, a hybrid, you can buy a Tesla. Now, this isn't to highlight the virtues of Tesla, but to get you to think about how does sustainability think about us, uh, challenge us to think differently about what is the automobile. And Avery Lovins is always great for bending your mind on these kinds of things. And he asks the question, what is the car of the future? Is it a car with a computer or is it a computer on wheels? Now, he said this like 10 years ago. And now, today, what do we have? Well, we have the recognition that it is a computer on wheels. And now you have companies entering the market like Google and Apple, uh, Alphabet. Uh, it is a totally different game. It is changing the market. The big three, with their amazing capacity to manufacture, uh, are no longer, they no longer have this, the core competencies necessary for the car of the future. And I could envision a day where there will be an entrant like Dell. Why have a, a store to buy these cars? Why can't you buy them over the web just like you buy a Dell computer and you can figure it yourself? Uh, that's where Tesla's trying to go with their small scale uh, retail outlets in uh, select urban centers. And then you can go even further. What does a car do? On the bottom, you have a picture of a Nissan Leaf. Now this is an electric car and you can buy one in Japan. In Japan, you can also buy a transformer. And so if you have a power failure in your home, you can plug your car into your home. You can run the home off the power pack in your car. And companies are now trying to develop a technology where if you do have an electric car, you can park it in a parking space and you can plug it into the grid. And the grid wants to use, they want to rent your batteries if they start to move into renewables like wind and solar. They're intermittent. And so energy companies need intermittent storage in order to deal with the intermittency of those power sources. Your batteries are sitting right there. 
you could plug it into the grid and the power company could pay you a short-term lease on your batteries while it's sitting idle. Now think about that for a second. Right now, as I speak, 95% of the cars in the fleet are sitting idle. They're doing nothing. What if they were put to use making you money while they're sitting idle? That is a potential innovation on what is the car in our society. And then you can start to go further and think about where do we go with driverless cars and do you need a car at all? And if that disappears, do we need the driveway at your house or the garage behind it or most of the streets or many of the parking garages that are, uh, dot our landscape? These are the kind of cultural shifts going on as we go forward. Let me offer two more examples and think about the market shift around sustainability. Underneath that uh, hybrid, I'm sorry, the, uh, the SUV on the left, we have a standard faucet. And in buildings now, we're having more and more faucets that are motion sensors. You stick your hand underneath the sink, or the faucet, the water goes on, you wash your hands. Uh, this is good for um, dealing with germs. It also uses less water. You don't leave the water running. Now, one of the biggest costs of doing that in an existing building is running the wires. It's very expensive to snake wires through walls to get power to the, all the sinks and all the bathrooms. And then a developer, came, an innovator came along and said, but wait a minute, we already have power there. And it's in the form of water pressure. So he developed the device that's sitting to the right of the Tesla, which has a generator in the water line. Every time you turn the water on, it spins the generator, powers the battery, off you go. You've got power source for that um, that motion uh, activated sink. And this, to my mind, highlights a, a quote by Edwin Land that uh, I've always liked. He said, the first step in having a new idea is stop having an old idea. And our young people that are coming into the market see opportunities where many of us older people see only problems. They are not encumbered by these old ideas that get in the way. And they are super thrilled and excited and jazzed to jump into this area of business sustainability 1.0 to find market opportunities to deal with the issues we face. And that's where I want to leave you with one last example. On the bottom, we have a standard coal-fired power plant. We can start to move towards wind or solar. These are new forms of energy. We can start to think about geothermal and tidal, all kinds of sources of energy where we never thought about them before. And let me offer you one more. To the right, above the Nissan LEAF, is a schematic for a train station in Tokyo. Now, it produces energy, I have to say it's not cost-effective energy, but the key is, it's drawing energy from a source we overlook every day, and that's the footsteps of the thousands of people that pass the train station every day. They have sensors in the floor that take the impact of those people passing through, and that creates electricity. And one of my students told me there's actually a dance club in Stockholm that uses the same technology uh, to create electricity, and there it is. You know, first step in having a new idea is stop having an old idea. How many more innovations are out there to address our sustainability challenges uh, in ways that create opportunity for companies and create a market shift? Now, this is Business Sustainability 1.0, and this is the way I've been teaching it uh, since I started teaching this in the mid-1990s. I don't teach cor corporate social responsibility. I teach business strategy. Uh, I feel that if I teach corporate social responsibility, when students come into my class, I'm telling them, learn how to maximize NPV, ROI, ROA, and your other classes. But in my class, I'm going to teach you a different value set. And that is not sustainable for their careers or for the business. So this is a way to connect sustainability to the core strategy of the company. And this is important. And this is getting us to move forward. We now live in a world where you can stay in a sustainable hotel. You can eat sustainable food. You can drive a sustainable car. You can buy a sustainable paintbrush. Everything's going sustainable. We should be excited about this. The world is becoming sustainable. But you can see where I'm going. There's a big but. And the but is that many of the problems that, that these efforts are meant to solve are getting worse. To mark what that means, uh, geophysicists have proposed that we have now entered a new geological epoch, that we've left the, the Holocene and we've entered the Anthropocene. And... Mm -hmm. The, the simple way to describe that is that we are, you cannot describe the environment out there right now without including the role of humans in running it, basically, in starting to take control of some of the operating systems on Earth. We have dammed most of the major rivers. We've cultivated most of the major land. We have now taken control of many of the systems. And to give voice to that, uh, they've just, the geophysicists have described nine planetary boundaries beyond which we should not go 
three of which we are going. If we go beyond these boundaries, we're no longer in a safe operating space for humanity. And the three we've crossed are climate change, the nitrogen cycle, and biodiversity loss. On biodiversity loss, uh, uh, scientists worry that uh, by 2050, uh, a significant number of the species that we have today will be gone. By 2100, as many as 50% of those species will be gone. On nitrogen, we produce more nitrogen than natural processes. This creates algae blooms in the Great Lakes. It creates a dead zone in the mouth of the Mississippi River. You can see phosphorus is right behind that. And of course, climate change. We're taking control of uh, the, the atmosphere. We're taking tr control of the climate in ways that we don't fully understand uh, that have tremendous import for uh, what kind of a world our children and our grandchildren will grow up in. To give you a sense of how to think about the Anthropocene and really put it in perspective, sometimes you have to be shocked because I think we could become dull to what, what is often called the new normal. You know, climate change is the new normal. Increased storm severity, more forest fires, more droughts, more flooding, uh, more hurricanes. This is now the new normal. And sometimes it helps to hear something that just says, wait a minute, something is not right here. And I had one last year. I was talking to a research chemist at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. And he said, matter of factly in the conversation, there are measurable levels of ibuprofen in the Mediterranean Sea. And I was stunned by both the ease with which he said it and the content of what he said. And he went on to say, you know, that doesn't concern us. Ibuprofen is a relatively benign compound. What really concerns us are birth control pills and antidepressants. You take a drug. Many times the drug doesn't even change. Uh, it doesn't even get used by your system. Its mere presence does what it needs to do. Uh, other times, your body may use 10 to 15% of it. The rest passes through your body, enters the treatment plant. The treatment plant can't handle it. It enters the aquatic ecosystem. It changes the flora and the fauna. We're not having strange birth defects in the animals within the aquatic ecosystem. And importantly, hearkening back to Rachel Carson's warnings way back in the 60s, we get our food and our drinking water from those sources. And to give you a sense of that, last year, Biologists in Seattle were analyzing salmon in Puget Sound, and what did they find? They found Prozac. They found 40 prescription drugs. They even found cocaine in the bodies of salmon, salmon that we are eating in our restaurants and our food. So welcome to the Anthropocene. That is human beings taking charge of systems on Earth without really knowing it. Now, of course, sustainability is more than just environmental. We also have the social issues and we are pushing up against some boundaries in the social space that are quite concerning as well. Income inequality is reaching uh, record levels. Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate in economics, has been writing about the dangers, the social instability this can create. Certainly environmental justice is giving voice to people, small island states, people in low-lying areas of Bangladesh to say climate change is an issue we need to attend to. Human rights, education, healthcare, these are all entering uh, the attention of the market, the attention of business. And so we can put this all together and say this has tremendous import for how we think about business sustainability. Uh, Gail Whiteman at the University of Lancaster uh, likes to say that those planetary boundaries on the left side of the screen are the key performance indicators, the KPAs, KPIs of the planet. And how can companies start to think about that in that sense as we start to take on an important role of addressing these issues how do we do that? And there's the real challenge because we're not really sure how to deal with this. We really don't know what we're doing. Stephen Jay Gould captured it quite nicely. He said, when we have become by the power of glorious evolutionary accident called intelligence, the stewards of life's continuity on earth. We did not ask for this role, but we cannot abjure it. We may, may, not, may not be suited to it, but here we are. And I think that captures it. We're, we're stumbling into the Anthropocene and business will find itself, because of its tremendous power, dealing with these issues, and we're starting to see that happen. One response from people who think about business sustainability in, in the Anthropocene is say that capitalism is the problem. Naomi Klein has her book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate. And we start to have a debate, capitalism is good, the end of capitalism is, is near. I find this debate rather tiresome and really not helpful. Uh, capitalism is neither static nor monolithic. Uh, it is actually quite malleable. It is this man-made, human-made institutions in the service of humans. It can adapt to the evolving needs of humans. It's done in the past on things like uh, uh, um, uh, 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 
a whole host of issues. I'm having a mental block here. Um, you can't collude. You can't price fix. You can't sell drugs. These are all rules within the market. And we, had, we accept those as true. And capitalism can evolve to deal with the issues we face around sustainability. And capitalism has many forms. Uh, uh, Scandinavian capitalism is very different than American capitalism. It's very different than Japanese capitalism. And so we need to think about where are we going? Where is capitalism going to handle these kinds of issues? Uh, again, hearkening back to Stephen Jay Gould, he has a wonderful essay uh, that I had to read as a doctoral student called The Creation Myths of Cooperstown. His major point was every institution we have is a product of an institution we had before. It's a constant evolution. You never have a chance to wipe the slate clean and, as Naomi Klein says, shred capitalism and develop a new system. We don't have that option before us. In that essay with Stephen Jay Gould, he pointed out that the notion that uh, Abner Doubleday invented baseball in Cooperstown, New York in 1896 is quite preposterous. He was looking at a, set, a game that was evolving over time, and he simply wrote the rules down as he saw them at that time. Similarly, uh, Adam Smith did not invent a capitalism in 1776 when he wrote Wealth of Nations. He was watching a system evolve in mercantile Europe and the United Kingdom, and he simply wrote down what he saw. And capitalism has evolved quite a bit since then, and it will continue to evolve. And the fun thing for students and those who are students, whether it's in my classroom or students of business, is that you can start to see the signals of where capitalism may be going in the Anthropocene now. Again, a quote from William Gibson, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. We can see signs of change, and there are many. And this is just a smattering of a sample of uh, places where people are pushing up against the system right now and trying to come up with new ideas. So I'd like to give you a glimpse of what I see as sustainability 2.0, market transformation. So on the left, we have enterprise integration, going back to my original si slide, but filling it out a little more. And on the right, we have market transformation. Again, on the left, fit sustainability in with pre-existing considerations, operational efficiency, cost of capital, market, uh, market demand. That is expedient, that's helpful, but you lose something in the process. The focus of that effort is really about reducing unsustainability, doing less bad. And I'm, I'm echoing John Ehrenfeld here, who has been influential in my career, um, thinking about that's about reducing unsustainability. On the right, market transformation is about new models to help companies transform the markets around them and re-examining some take and forget belief. And the focus there is creating sustainability. And that is a fundamentally different approach. Again, thinking back to John Ehrenfeld. Reducing unsustainability, doing less bad, creating sustainability, doing good are two completely different approaches for th thinking about sustainable business. As a metaphor, John and I have written about this, think about what we've done in Iraq. We stopped the war. Now we're trying to create the peace. Totally different way of thinking, totally different way of dealing with this. So how do we stop the war on the world, on the environment, and create peace with the environment? Well, one thing is to shift from the, the present focus on reducing carbon emissions, which is great, which is important, but it will not solve the problem. We eventually have to go carbon negative. We have actually eventually have to go carbon, new, I'm sorry, carbon neutral and then carbon negative. And that, again, is a fundamentally different approach. On the left is focusing on corporate strategy, but to go carbon neutral, carbon negative, we have to focus on systems change. We have to change the system. And that, again, it's not about enterprise integration and one company's benefit. It's about market transformation and companies trying to change the system around them. That's the only way we'll get there. On the left, the environment and the social sciences, business strategy, the business enterprise are totally separate. On the right, they're linked. The idea of the Anthropocene links them for us. If we are in charge of the environment out there, we have to think differently. Uh, the left will help me get a job, uh, get me tenure. On the right, it will help me make a difference. On the left, it will help our students get a job. On the right, we'll have them help them have a career and a vision for a future. And I like to th have them think about the idea of a vocation or a calling in business. So let's sort of break down what are the components of market transformation as I see them. One, new conceptions of system parameters. We have to think about changing the system. So the idea of one company developing a sustainable product, calling it sustainable, actually makes no empirical sense. A utility installing a wind farm or a solar array and saying, look, we're a sustainable company, it doesn't make sense. We have to think about sustainability in terms of energy generation, transmission, distribution, use, and mobility. And now we can start to think about sustainability of the system. 
and that changes the role of the company within the system. How do they change the system around them? How does a utility change use, mobility, transmission, distribution, generation throughout the system? That's where the, shift, the, the focus has to start to shift. We start to think differently about operational parameters, and we start to think about new forms of supply chain logistics, start to think about the circular economy, and not just closing loops, but also thinking about keeping materials at their highest use. And that requires a different way of thinking about what we produce, thinking about its life cycle, system dynamics, how do we use them going forward. We can start to think about new types of partnerships, and not just working with those that have uh, direct links with what we produce, but ways of thinking about the system. A utility changing generation transmission use has to start to deal with different sets of partnerships. I think about, for example, my energy lifestyle. This is Ford's attempt to start to think about what does an electrified lifestyle look like if, if people start to use our electric cars. Well, they need to start to partner with appliance manufacturers like Whirlpool, uh, solar companies like SunPower, uh, all kinds of companies. Think about what does the uh, electrified home look like? How do we shift from AC to DC power? How do we start to have appliances that, uh, refrigerators for example, that will go in the defrost cycle when energy is cheapest? Uh, run your dryer where energy is cheapest. Um, start to think more carefully. Uh, operational parameters, start to think differently about government engagement and start to think about how companies can work constructively with government to try and create the systemic changes that we need. And we see examples of that. Intel, for example, was uh, tremendously influential in the attention within the electronics industry to conflict minerals from the Democratic Republic of Congo and work with the government to have uh, uh, com uh, components of the Dodd-Frank Act compel electronic manufacturers to see if they're sourcing minerals from Congo and report that. That leads to transparency. How do we think differently about transparency? Companies are reporting on GRI, uh, CDP, but how do they go further? to disclose the many different trans, uh, sustainability implications of their business. And I think about, for example, Nestle did an analysis of their supply chains, their fish supply chains, and what did they find? They found uh, human trafficking slavery in Asia. Now, what did they do? Well, they disclosed it, which is quite interesting because companies don't usually do that. But they disclosed it by saying, we were surprised to find this, and if you're sourcing fish from that area of the world, you may, may be just surprised to find, uh, if you look closely, what, what you're going to find. So different conceptions of transparency and visibility. And then resource availability, human rights are entering the agenda in ways that never did before. The idea that water is no longer a resource that we can count on is fundamentally changing companies like Coca-Cola that now start to think of themselves more as a water company than a soft drink company and start to think about the, the context in which they draw water. Particularly, you know, they've, they've had some issues in India where they were drawing water because of their deep bore wells, but the neighboring farmers could not. And that had tremendous implications for their license to operate in that area, and they started to think systemically. We can start to think differently about organizational parameters and move beyond just one type of way of organizing a company. We can start to think about hybrid organizations and benefit corporations. We can start to think about networked organizations, uh, employee-owned, uh, co-ops. We can start to think differently about how do we create organizations where our employees thrive, and that brings in positive organizational scholarship and appreciative inquiry. Start to think differently about how our organizations are structured, and we're starting to see that play out as well. And then finally, different metrics and models. There are certain metrics that we count on that lead us in unsustainable directions. Uh, gross domestic product is one. Uh, gross domestic product just uh, uh, just measures any movement of money. So. I could, uh, for example, go to Krispy Kremes and eat donuts every morning and GDP goes up. And then I have a heart attack and go to the hospital, GDP goes up. And then I die and there's a funeral and GDP goes up. Anytime money moves, GDP goes up. So a country could, for example, de totally deforest its country and sell those products, GDP goes up. But what have they done to future uh, generations' ability to make money? They've destroyed it. Or a company could make a product, say GDP goes up. They can dump their waste into a river or a lake. Uh, GDP goes up because they were able to increase their profits. Then someone has to come and clean up that lake, and GDP goes up. The local people may be if, uh, impacted by that and had to raise their health care costs. GDP goes up. Certainly, GDP has some problems. And a very nice report was done by Nicolas Sark uh, the, the president of France commissioned uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen to come with alternatives to GDP for the government of France. Read the report. It's a very interesting read on a different way to think about GDP. Going further, discount rates can get us into trouble. 
uh, a standard disc rate, discount rate of 5% has implicit within it everything 20 years and beyond is worthless. Is that true when we start to think about addressing climate change? That's called your children, your grandchildren's future. And Nicholas Stern raised this question when he started to analyze the costs and benefits of addressing climate change by saying it's inherently immoral to use discount rates on certain kinds of issues. And he used an absurdly low discount rate, which has opened himself up to criticism, but raised some interesting questions about how do we think differently about discount rates. Other areas, you know, neoclassical economics, agency theory, the idea that we're all, uh, the purpose of the corporation is merely to make money is starting to come under attack. Even Jack Welsh has started to say that the idea of the purpose of the corporation just to make money is, is the quote unquote, the dumbest idea in the world. Uh, and so, you know, ideas like Peter Drucker's idea that the purpose of a corporation is to create a market and serve that market well are starting to be uh, re-asked and start to enter the conversation. And how do we start to think differently about consumption? And is sustainable consumption an oxymoron? The World Business Council for Sustainable Development is starting to ask questions around this. Patagonia has started to ask questions around this. How do companies think of differently about consumption? I was just heard a presentation by Maple Leaf, a company in Canada, the largest meat producer, that is starting to promote the idea that we wanna see meat consumption in moderation not maximize, but in moderation because they want healthy consumers. That is a totally different way of thinking about what we have a company doing. And this gets to the crux of just questioning, taking for granted beliefs and models of how we think about business, its purpose, what it does. I want to close with one final thought and then open it up to questions. And that question is how far can this go? Where can this go? to think about what is sustainability 2.0, what is market transformation coming down the pike? And I, I, I offer for you uh, my grandparents, and uh, particularly my grandmother. She was born in 1899, she's seated right there. She died in 1995. Now, in the course of her lifetime, she saw the advent of indoor plumbing, the advent or indoor electrification. She saw the first car, the first flight, the first jet engine, man land on the moon, first computer, she saw all that and she saw much more. What will a child born today see in their lifetime? They will see that and more. A child born today will live into the late 2090s. Some of them will live into the next century. The world they will die in will be as different as the world that my grandmother saw shift. If I show my grandmother the world she would die in, she said, you're crazy. If I show a child today, a student coming into my classroom, if I could show them the world they would die in, They'd say equally, you're crazy. But that's how much will change. And the key is, what ways will it change? And so I leave my students and I leave you with this as well. A quote from Abraham Lincoln, it says, the best way to predict your future is to create it. I challenge you watching this webinar, I challenge my students. The world will be fundamentally different, but what role do you wanna have in making it a world that is sustainable? Students going into business today want to use the power of business to make a sustainable world. 20 years ago, those same students would have gone into schools of public policy or nonprofit management. Today, they're going into schools of business. That gives me hope that we will have the solutions to the problems that we face. That gives me hope that we'll have a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. And what a provocative thought of think of the solutions that we haven't think of today because definitely the only constant is change. So let me uh, start with a few questions for you. Uh, great presentation. So today, are companies taking these steps voluntarily, or are they just being pushed into it from outside pressures? How does that work? Well, every company is different. And in any kind of move, any kind of shift, you're going to have some that lead, some that lag, and some that are in the middle. So. Uh, market shifts always create winners and losers, and so you will have those that resist it and those that embrace it. Take a look at, for example, uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, uh, addressing climate change. Certainly coal companies are not excited about the idea of reducing greenhouse gas emissions unless we can uh, perfect carbon capture and sequestration. And so they're resisting moves to do that, and uh, we have policy proposals that are trying to help them weather that storm, but I believe that that is too late. The company, that, that the, the amount of jobs, the amount of development, the future technologies and renewable energies, alternative mobility, uh, alternative drivetrains, 
this is a market shift in play. And so you're going to have some companies that are going to embrace it. They're going to be pushing it. Some companies are going to resist it. And then the momentum of one over the other will turn the tide. And that's one area where I believe the tide has been turned. So some companies are going to embrace it and push it. Some companies are going to resist it. And some companies are going to be in the middle trying to figure out which way the, the tea leaves are blowing. Or the, the, I guess I mix metaphors there. But they're going, to, they're going to wait until the shift is right and then they're going to move. But the key on any kind of uh, market shift is you want to move when the time is right. You don't want to be too soon. You don't want to be too late. Uh, the key is to be right on the shift. Uh, you don't want to be... Uh, one step ahead of the, you don't want to be two steps ahead of competition, you just want to be one step ahead. And so companies that are going to benefit from the shifts will drive it. That's, that's very interesting because a lot of people think that um, being the first mover, right, uh, to, to catalyze faster the change um, is the best solution, but, but it has to be just right. It has to be kind of on the middle to make sure that there's benefit for the companies to make this transition. And it all comes down to the, 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 the strategy you want to have. Some companies want to be first movers. Some want to be fast followers. And, you know, uh, some recognize that the shift will not benefit them all. And every company is going to have to decide what their strategy is uh, to deal with these issues going forward. But they, they would be very unwise not to watch carefully what is happening and decide when the time is right to shift. Right. So, so we have talked about businesses overall and, and, the, and the role on this transformation. Uh, but what is the role of other others in this transition, like NGOs and civic leaders and consumers and voters? Well, you know, to, to take my metaphor of market transformation being about the system, it is not just companies. It's about the market. It's about shifting the market. And so all the constituents you mentioned and more have a role to play in this. Uh, Investors, the, the impact investing movement is growing and is tremendously important in this shift. Insurance companies, certainly around issues like climate change and uh, uh, natural catastrophe loss, business interruption insurance, directors insurance or office insurance uh, has a major role to play in this. Uh, scientists have a major role to play in this. I've done a lot of work with the National Climatic Dentist Center. They have nine petabytes of climate data. And the work we've been doing is how do we get this in the hands of business? And business is still trying to figure out how to use it, but consultants and insurance companies are starting to snatch it up because it, it's tremendously helpful to them to influence their business model on helping businesses move forward. So, And certainly government has a role to play in this. So I, do, I think we live in a strange time right now where governments have become incredibly uh, weak in dealing with these kinds of issues. They kind of be stuck in this inertia, but we're seeing a lot of activity, less so on the federal level, more so on the state and the city level. So we're starting to wake up to the, the money levels of government. Uh, consumers have a role to play in this. Um, even religions have an important play in this. Uh, the, the Pope's encyclical letter on climate change, on uh, our care for our common home, are going to impact people in ways that a, a, a market price or a regulatory policy uh, could never touch. If you connect this to people's personal religious beliefs, you're going to have a shift in the market and the way people think about how they live and what they do. And so all of it have a role to play in it. And, and then uh, the last thing I want to do is say that business is doing this by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we were talking about governments, and, and it seems that all these market transformation forces are coming, you know, from businesses or from consumers. Uh, so this means that the government is no longer going to be relevant for this market transformation? Absolutely not. Government is still tremendously important. Uh, tax credits for renewable energy, a carbon price, uh, are important enablers for these kinds of market shifts to take place. So the last point, I, I, the last thing I want you to take from my talk is that government is irrelevant. But business is taking a more prominent role. Um, the, the, the role of the corporation and society is shifting in ways that are new territory. Look at the gun control debate and companies stepping in on that in ways they never did before. You know, it used to be in the United States that there were laws banning government lobbying. Uh, even up until the 60s, it was seen as uh, improper for companies to directly lobby government. It wasn't until the 70s and go, going forward the companies started to step in and start to directly lobby governments. And I think that that's an important shift that 
you know, again, we can lament that fact. We can talk about uh, campaign finance reform, but the reality is companies have a role to play in driving government, and they do that. The Paris Climate Accord would not have taken place. It would not have been resolved if it wasn't for the presence of business in Paris trying to help a deal get done. And business still gets involved in, you know, recently uh, fuel efficiency standards for trucks, uh, reducing uh, HCFC emissions to address climate change. Business still has a role to play in government, and uh, government is still relevant, policy is still relevant, uh, whether it's at the international, the national, the state, or the city level. Okay, so that's, it seems like it's a great balance because uh, more stakeholders are coming into play to kind of push each other to move forward. So it seems that it's just that more people are getting engaged uh, to help the transformation to be faster. So that's a great place to be. Yep. And in this transformation, so you were talking about students 10 years ago going into uh, public policy and CSR rather than business schools. Uh, so today, what is the role that MBA education is going to be playing, if at all? I mean, it's just going to be one sustainability class or it's going to be something more embedded into the program? You know, I think that the role of business schools in this conversation is, is paramount. And, and that could be partly because of where I sit. But I, I look at MBA education as fairly unchanged, really at its root, at its core, uh, uh, for the past couple of decades, and that has to shift. As companies become more engaged and more relevant for these sustainability issues, uh, more relevant for the natural environment, uh, more relevant for the social environment, we need to start to shift uh, how we think about MBA education. As an example, when I first started at Michigan, 2004, 2005, uh, Bernie Evers had just been sentenced to prison. And there's a point to this story. And I, and I was struck because no one was talking about it. And I really found that strange because here was a guy that would be the paragon of what, we'd all, uh, what we would want all our graduates to become. He had formed this huge company, uh, WorldCom. And now it had gone down in the biggest bankruptcy in history, the biggest accounting scandal, um, only surpassed by Bernie Madoff. And no one was talking about it. And then I got in an elevator and there are two senior professors. And one turned to the other and said, what do you think of that sentence of Bernie Evers? He got 25 years in prison. And the other one said, I think it's ridiculous. It's not like he killed somebody. That always struck me because it, to me, it highlights the extent to which management education is not a caught up to the power and the importance and the responsibility that business managers have. And we need to integrate that into management education. So some ways I'd love to see that happen. One is begin with that. Students coming in, you are about to have awesome, awesome power and, and with that comes awesome responsibility. I personally would like to see us instill in our students a sense of calling or vocation. Management is a calling. And a calling has a, an element of service to society. How do we instill in our students that they have a service to society, uh, not just to their own wallet? Um, that is not a radical idea. Peter Drucker was talking about this in the 50s. Um, it wasn't until Milton Friedman and the uh, Chicago School of Free Market Economics came along and said, no, companies are just there to make money for its shareholders. Uh, that is an idea that it, it creates a lot of strange negative effects. Lynn Stout in Pennsylvania has been talking about that. It favors one kind of shareholder. That has a very short-term focus. And a lot of companies now don't want to go to the open market for that kind of a, a shareholder. They want more stable money, and that's where private equity starts to come in. But if we take that seriously, we start to think differently about how we teach management education. So for example, we should teach them some basic science of the impact of resource use uh, of the market on the natural environment. Teach them about the Anthropocene because it is the market that is doing that. Start to teach them about the impact in the social world. Uh, to teach them that when you start to have certain issues around healthcare, around um, benefits, around uh, living wages, uh, the, the role that businesses play in our social environment. Teach them some of that. How do they understand the role of business in the market? Teach them the evolution of the relationship between business and government. Uh, it's relatively recent incarnations since the 70s going forward. And start to teach them a role of productive, constructive engagement with government. Very few business schools have courses on lobbying, much less constructive lobbying. It really focuses on the law. So how do we teach business students and government students, for that matter, how to have a constructive role in policy formation. 
start to break down these stale you know, stereotypes that companies should go into lobby governments only for their individual benefit and not for the broader benefit of the world in which they live. Uh, these are all elements of a shift in what I would hope to see in management education to develop well-rounded, balanced future managers that have the interests of their company writ large, which includes their employees, their suppliers, their buyers, their customers, not just their shareholders, uh, and has them connected to the social and the environmental fabric in which they're embedded. And think about how to have a really enriching career where they serve the society in the sense of a vocation or a calling. That, to me, would be the kind of business education I would like to see going forward. And the one last question in regards to science. So what will be the role of science on this uh, government and business education? I mean, we have so many different outlets with different results, so how can they better pick? You know, right now, business students, unless they hunt far and wide and very hard, they, they will not get any, any science education. And so will they fully understand the implications of their operations on climate change if they don't even understand the simple basics of the carbon cycle or how climate change happens? How is it that energy use translates into climate change? Or if they're in the agricultural sector, if they work for Cargill and they don't understand nitrogen or phosphorus, um, how they understand the ways in which their sector impacts the natural environment. We need to develop new kinds of science education courses. They, you know, right now students can go hunt out a course in chemistry or engineering. It's not going to be geared towards them. <clears throat> so how can we develop a new kinds of science education course that's geared towards future business leaders? Um, that is perhaps something that that the Dow may have a say in because it's a science-based company and the science-based industries have thought about science in a way that does translate directly to business strategy. And how do we develop those kinds of courses as in a way to make science accessible and understandable to an MBA student is a challenge for higher education. And, and, and part of that, one of the problems we have in higher education is our education is very siloed. We're discipline silos. Um, chemistry is chemistry and has a wall around it. Business is business, has a wall around it. How do we break down those silos so that students in business can easily access content in public policy? in sociology, psychology, um, political science, engineering. Uh, I would love to see graduate students come out of business programs where they not only know how to finance a deal to put in a wind farm, they know the technological hurdles that need to be overcome to really break through the price barrier and how close are we to cra cra cracking those. They'll understand the social implications of why people are opposing wind farms as they see them ugly. Uh, they'll understand the policy implications that will make the market go or slow it down. They'll understand the whole scope of the issue and not just the dollars that connect with financing a wind deal. That is what I'd like to see uh, from management education in the future. Thank you, Andy. This has been a great talk and experience uh, for everybody. Remember, we are agents of change every day. And as members of a society, of a family, of a community, as employees at a company, how can we think things differently? So keep that in mind. And I will ask you to always remember to be intentional about your decisions and to take action. With that, thank you so much for joining us to this Elements of Sustainability series. Until the next one.